Hi, my name is Nora Neal, and I teach writing in the English department at Grand Rapids Community College. And today I have the absolute honor of introducing Jeanette Walls, the best-selling author of the memoir The Glass Castle and the true life novel um, Half Broke Horses. And to start off our conversation today, Jeanette, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about The Glass Castle and the stories of poverty that you share. And I wonder if there is a particular memory that you have when you realized that you were poor. You know, Nora, um, I, I think that those of us who grew up in a sort of a strange world think that that's normal. Mm -hmm. And um, for much of my life, I, I, I didn't necessarily think it was normal because my father was so shrewd in thinking it wasn't just uh, that it was our choice that we lived this way because we were special and that regular kids, kids that weren't as brave and strong as I me, mean, they needed things like pillows and stupid plastic toys. and. He'd sort of taught us to feel sorry for other kids who mm -hmm. led a normal life. Mm -hmm. um, at a certain point in life, I realized that a lot of kids pointed at us. Mm -hmm. And I realized it wasn't out of admiration. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I clung to my father's myths beyond the point that I, I sort of knew that he wasn't being completely honest, but I needed to believe in something or someone. So I clung to his reality longer than I probably should have. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that's one of the reasons that I call the book The Glass Castle is because through all this poverty and this craziness and, and sleeping in cars and sleeping in cardboard boxes, Dad told us that, that that was all temporary, that one of these days he would build us a great big mansion out in the desert, and he called it The Glass Castle, and I, and I clung to that notion that this poverty was temporary, that one of these days I would have a nice place to live. And I've come to believe that that hope, that dream for the future, is an incredibly valuable gift. You know, it's funny because my older sister, when you bring up the glass castle, she sees that as a sort of a bitter memory, as a, an unfulfilled promise. And one of, one of the, the things in, in telling your story, even though it's, it's nonfiction, we shape our truths by how we choose to see things. And in sitting down to write my story, you know, I realized the degree to which I bought into the myth. Um, and if I were smarter and shrewder like my older sister, I would have said, ah, just in one of my father's BS lines. And, and, and so in telling the story, do I, do I unmask my father early on and say, you know, he was such a liar. He was telling us all this stuff that he could have never possibly have done for us. Or, or do, do you cling to those beliefs that get you through the tough times? Yeah, and I wonder why you think that you clung on to your father's um, glass castle longer than your brother and older sister did. Do you think that there was something different about you or a reason that you clung, on, clung to that? You know, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, I believe that I wanted to believe in something bigger and greater. I, I, I've always been sort of an optimist. Um, I, I don't know if it has to do with birth order and my older sister sort of needing to face mm -hmm. reality, but my younger brother also. I mean, to this day, you know, my, my brother became a cop um, and he sees things a lot more in black and white than I do. Mm -hmm. And we've discussed a lot my, my take on the story because if, if any of my siblings had written The Glass Castle, it would have been an entirely different book with the facts not necessarily being one bit different. But, but the perspective would have been different. And to this day, my brother and I will look at an old house and I'll say, oh, what a great old house. And my brother will say, structural damage going on there. You know, and we're both right. We're both accurate. But it all depends on what you, what you choose to focus on. So I don't know if there's some, some, something in my biology or whatever, but, but I just always have been an optimist. And in that regard, I mean, I, I think I'm a lot luckier than many people because I do think that I think it's less about what you were given in life than how you choose to view those things. I think that a, a positive attitude will get you through a lot of things. Maybe I've just inherited my mother's capacity for denial. No, I would deny that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that a little optimism and even maybe a, a little bit of denial will get you a long way, yeah. So you feel like you choose to look at the world from an optimistic perspective and look at the best side of things? I do, I do. Um, Beyond that, I, I do think I was luckier than a lot of kids um, who were raised in similar circumstances. I mean, you know, 
I am not the only poor kid in the world. And, and I've, I've run into a lot of people who, you know, some who come from much better circumstances than me, who tell me that they're still so angry with their parents mm -hmm. for not having done a little bit more for them. And, and you know, you can, you can either focus on what you weren't given or focus on what you were given. And, and when I focus on what I was given, I believe my parents gave me a great love of learning, mm -hmm. a great, they, I, I cannot remember a point in my life that I couldn't read. Mm -hmm. um, there were always books around the house. My mom and dad just made sure, you know, they'd go to the library and come back with pillowcases full of books. And love, uh, learning was just such an adventure. And when we weren't reading, we were going out exploring nature. My father was explaining geology or uh, astronomy to us. And um, I, I, I believe that if you're given a love of learning and, and a sense of self-esteem, uh, a sense that you deserve the good things in life, that the rest is all gravy. Ideally, you get the food and clothing as well. I'll acknowledge that. But if you were given the tools to take care of yourself and a belief that you deserve that better life, then I, I believe that, 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 that in some ways you're much luckier than kids who may, might have been given tons of, of resources, but not the knowledge how to use them. Mm -hmm. So is that why you're able to present your family in such a compassionate <laughs> way, in a more um, objective way? And I mean, when, yeah. whenever I've seen you talk yeah. about your family, yeah. it's in such a compassionate, accepting way, which is so commendable. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that's how you arrived at that place. Well, you know, it's it's funny. Some people say it's commendable. Some people say that I <laughs> that I'm not being entirely honest about how how terrible my childhood was, and um, I, I love the word you used, acceptance, because for me that's that's key. Some people have asked me how I could forgive my parents, how I could forgive them for the upbringing that I have, but I'm not, I'm not nuts about the word forgiveness because to me that sets me up as as a victim, and I don't mm. see it that way. Um, my mother could not take care of herself. How could I possibly expect her to take care of me? I'm not saying that at, the t at times it wasn't frustrating. At times I just went, Mom, get a job. You know, my mother was highly educated, and she could have gotten a job. But after we kids left and she became homeless, I, and I saw that, you know, she really, she, she doesn't have these, these basic skills. Um, so to me, it's, it's less about criticizing her for what she didn't do, then just accepting this is who my mother is. And, and my father was an alcoholic, and anybody who's ever loved an alcoholic or any sort of addict, I hope eventually comes to the conclusion that, look, they might love you, but <laughs> they have, uh, the alcoholism preoccupies their, their wants and needs and desires. And I, I, I wanted to be able to fix my father for a long time, and I, I had to come to the very tough conclusion that I couldn't. And as much as I love my father, and I believe he loved me, he was an alcoholic, and I couldn't change that. And once I accepted that, and I realized, you know, he's not only not gonna build me a glass castle, he, and he will not put me out of harm's way. In fact, he will put me in harm's way, and I have to remove myself from this situation. And that was a very, very tough decision, a, a, a tough realization. Um, and I realized that I, I had to leave home. The conclusion I came to well after that was that, that my parents, the, the chaotic life that they led, it was, in a way it was their choice, but I've even begun to question the whole concept of choice. Mm -hmm. If people don't have the capacity to take care of themselves, it, 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 was my mother homeless by choice? You know, she, my mother now lives with me. She, I, I, I take care of her. And, she would, she would be on the streets if I weren't there. So, so is it a choice? I mean, she loves having a home. She loves having flush toilets and a place to wash up. So she just she doesn't have the capacity to take care of, of herself and, and, or me. Um, and so how could I possibly forgive her for being who she is? I forgive you for being incompetent. You know, you just, you just accept that that's who and what she is. And if I can accept that those are her limitations, then I think that in other areas, she has incredible gifts. My mother is so brilliant. It astonishes me sometimes when I talk to her. She's so much smarter than me. She knows something about everything. If I talk to her about Alexander Graham Bell, she started railing on about his African-American assistant who didn't get the help, the credit he deserved. How does she know all these things? You know, uh, uh, one time when I was talking to her, um, these stupid carpenter bees started flying around our head. And, and I was thinking, stupid carpenter bees, I gotta kill them and get some poison. And my mom saw me looking at them and she said, 
aren't they wonderful? It's sort of like having pets that you don't need to feed. They're so friendly. And I was thinking, oh, I need to be a little bit more like her. I need to accept all creatures for what they are. And I said, you know, I said, Mom, you know, they bore holes in the wood and they, you know, they, they destroy things. She said, every creature needs a place to live. And she just really does accept all things for what they are. And, and if you would have told me at some point that I would say I need to be more like my mother, I would have said, you're crazy. I want to be nothing like that. No, I want her out of my life. But she does have things to offer if, if I accept her those things on her terms. Now, my brother got together with her one time and asked her to apologize for the way that we were raised. I said, Brian, it's, it's not going to happen. Mom doesn't see it that way, and she doesn't. And so it was a long and tearful conversation with her in saying, ultimately, I did the best I could, and I sort of believe that. And, and I've also come to realize, you know, Mom, now that she's living with me, she's more sane than she's ever been. She's still a little loopy. She'll always be a little eccentric. But I realize the degree to which her wackiness when she was raising us was trying to adapt to the chaotic situation that my father had created and to try to put the po a positive spin on everything. And it's what got her through. Um, I am very much not like my mother. I'm very different. Um, one of my mother's few objections when she read The Glass Castle, she didn't read it while I was working on it, but after, after it became a bestseller, she read it. She said, it must be pretty good. Other people like it. And she said, I'm not as passive as you described me to be. And I said, Mom, I, I would never describe you as passive. But once I thought about it, she is. She just sort of lets things happen and accepts them for what they are. I'm all the time trying to change things and make them better. Um, and, and I could be a little bit more passive, but I think maybe she, she carries it to an extreme. She does just go with the flow, and that's the way she always will be. Yeah, and you um, mentioned that after the Glass Castle, readers wanted to know more about yeah. your mother, and that was what prompted you to begin interviewing um, your mom for your what became your true life novel, right. Hasbro Courses. And so I wonder if there's anything you can add to what you just um, described so well about your mom that might illuminate her a little bit better or bring some of that understanding that your audience is really searching for. Well, you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm very drawn to nonfiction, um, the first is I have no imagination. <laughs> I'm totally incapable of making things up. I, um, I tried to fictionalize The Glass Castle. And before, when I was in my teens and 20s, I tried to write the story, and I was so embarrassed by it. I thought, I'll write this as fiction. And I, I couldn't think what I'm supposed to change. I mean, I I anytime I tried to have somebody do something that they didn't, it was, well, this is out of character. They wouldn't have behaved this way. Um, so I sort of, I have one little slim talent in the world, and that's digging things out. So <laughs> if it's out there, I can dig it out, but I can't make things up. Um, and after I, I, I'd written The Glass Castle, my publisher started pressuring me to write another book. And I was like, well, I only got that one story. And people were saying, well, write about your life now. And I know that's too boring. I just, I've got such a cushy life now. Nobody wants to hear about it. But it was readers who kept on saying, I understand your father. I understand alcoholism. But your mother is a mystery to me. Why would somebody with the resources to lead a somewhat normal life choose the life of chaos that she chose? And um, I, 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 as I said, I. I'm drawn to, to nonfiction because I think the truth is always out there if you are willing to dig deeply enough. Nothing is truly a mystery. Once you keep on digging, oh my gosh, here is the explanation. Um, my mother, in her childhood, she lived on a 180,000 acre ranch and um, she had complete freedom. And I believe that most, much of her adulthood was trying to recreate the freedom that she had in her childhood. There were no rules. There, there was no structure. Her mother, my grandmother, Lily, was a very uh, domineering woman, and, and she, my mother really shaped under those, those rules, and she, and she was ultimately, my mother was sent off to boarding school, which she hated. It was a disaster. So I decided to go ahead and try to tell that story, the story of my mother. The story ended up being about my grandmother at my mom's suggestion when I, when I proposed the idea to write um, my mother's life. My mother was all for it, but she said, you know, this book really should be about my mother my grandmother, her mother. She said, because she's the one who led the truly interesting life. And at first I resisted because I couldn't interview Lily. She died when I was um, uh, about um, six years old, eight years old. And um, I couldn't interview her. And I thought that would, that would create problems. So I would just tell Lily's story as the backstory. But then the more I interviewed mom, the more I realized that mom was right, that Lily really did lead the more interesting life, largely because my mother's so passive. And my, my grandmother was such an assertive, aggressive woman. She was this 
gun-toting, card-playing, hooch-selling, horse-breaking school teacher. And she just, you know, she rode one time 500 miles. When she was 15 years old, she rode 500 miles on a pony for her first teaching job. She hadn't even graduated from high school. She was a real tough old broad. And I say her that with great affection. And, and I, I ultimately decided that by telling my grandmother's story, I could tell my mother's story. Um, because the glass castle, for example, it's not really about me, it's about my parents. Um, when, when the glass castle, when the movie rights were sold, Hollywood Reporter said, the role of Jeanette Walls is really not that interesting. But her two parents, <laughs> those roles are catnip for serious actors looking to play charismatic scoundrels. And I completely believe that. And if you want to tell somebody's story, you tell the story of their childhood. Mm -hmm. So I, I figured that the best way to tell mom's story was to tell her mother's story. But my mother was really the only source I had on it. I tried to do some sort of cursory research, but some of the some of the facts started conflicting with what mom told me. And when I said, "Well, mom, this book on your great grandfather said this," and she goes, "Ah, oh, that's one of the lies the Mormons told." That I, so you so any so I, I was faced with this dilemma that I suppose any historian is is when we have conflicting tells which story do you believe? And if I wanted to write a strict history, then you provide both. Well, this. This source says this, and this source says this. So I decided to just write my grandmother's story as a novel. Um, I call it a true life novel. I did not do any genre creating. That's uh, Nolan Naylor, Executioner's Song was called a true life novel. And people ask me, well, how much did you make up? That's, that's sort of not the point. I, it, it, is a, it, is, it, it is my grandmother's story as is passed down through several generations. And I couldn't in good conscience call it nonfiction. There were a couple of people who were actually trying to urge me to, to, to call it nonfiction, but I wrote it in first person by somebody who's been dead for more than 40 years, so I couldn't very well say, oh, this is all true. I put a lot of thoughts into her head, but it is as close to the truth as I could get it in Lily's voice. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Lily is an unconventional woman oh, yeah. for oh, yeah. the <laughs> time, <laughs> which is part of the reason that she's so great in many moments. Um, I am wondering how much her gender influenced your interpretation of her life. You know, Lily was, she was, as I said, she's a tough old broad, and I, I, I say that with great affection. And a couple of people who've read Half Broke Horses said to me, she was a hard woman. Well, you had to be hard then. And one of the reasons that I wanted to tell Lily's story is that in some ways I think she was so extraordinary. She was so resourceful and strong and she just went without. In another way, I think that she's astonishingly common. I think that there are so many of us out there with grandmas and great grandmas very much like Lily Casey. Um, and one of the reasons that I wanted to tell Lily's story is that, well, touring on behalf of the Glass Castle, so many people have said to me, oh, you're so strong and you're so resilient. I could have never survived without indoor plumbing and all the things you did. And I'm very flattered by the compliment, but it's nonsense, of course you could. Because as much as I love my indoor plumbing today, <laughs> um, you, all you have to do is look back 100, 150 years ago and nobody had indoor plumbing, pretty much. And you know, I, I, I love modern luxuries. I think that they're great and we've all got iPods and remotes and all these things. I think they're magnificent as long as you don't start thinking that you can't survive without them. Um, Oscar Wilde once said, a, a necessity is a luxury once sampled. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, that, that we think we can't survive without all these things. And one of the great things about having a rough childhood is you know how little you really need to survive. So I wanted to tell Lily's story to remind people of a time not so long ago when pretty much nobody had these resources. And, and readers who think I could have never survived what you did, just think back a few generations. Most people who live in this country come from really hardy stock. And our ancestors came over from potato famines or to get away from the Nazis or on slave ships or whatever and had really rough lives and, and did the backbreaking work that you needed to do to establish yourself in this country. And like I said, I, I, I treasure the luxuries that we have today, but just don't forget how strong you are. And, and that I, I think we're all so much stronger than we, than we realize. And that if you can get in touch 
you know, a lot of people today talk about getting in touch with your inner child, and I think that's all well and good. But I also think we need to get in touch with our inner tough old bras and our inner tough old coots that are our ancestors to think about, you know, we're all so much stronger than we realize. And one of the great blessings of having a tough childhood is I know how strong I am. I don't need to prove that to myself or anybody else. What I had to, what I had to adjust to, what it took me a while to realize, you know, I'm a fighter and a scrapper, and that's both a curse and a, and a blessing. And, and, and the blessing is that it helped me get through some tough times. The curse is I think that I was too prepared to fight. That anybody looked at me cross-eyed, I was, you know, I was in their face, honey, you can't, uh, you know? And I, I was totally unprepared for how kind and warm the reception to my story would be and how good people are and how many people have stories so similar to mine. So I think those of us who've had tough childhoods we sort of think that that's what we, that that's who and what we are, that we're just these, these tough people. And But the people who haven't had tough childhoods, they don't think that they could deal with it. So I think that everybody just sort of needs to cut themselves a little bit of slack. The people who, who were raised, so many people come up to me and say, oh, you're going to hate me when I tell you this, but I was... I was raised in great wealth and I never went with, why would I hate somebody who was <laughs> raised in great wealth? They didn't, they didn't cause me any problems. It was my mom and dad. Who, you know, no, no, I got no problems with people. If people, it, it astonishes me how hard people are on themselves. And, and you know, one of my messages is cut yourself some slack. If you, if you come from, you know, a trashy background, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't define who you are. If you come from a privilege, well, of course it defines a little bit. Just, to some degree, we're all products of where we came from, but you don't have to be a prisoner to that. What advice would you give your younger self, your adolescent self, um, knowing what you do now yeah. and having this perspective? Is there anything you would say other than cut yourself in the <laughs> flat? You know, um, I, I, I got to hand it to my mom and dad. I think that they gave me pretty good advice all along. Um, if, if I could give some advice to my younger self, it would be just, just tough it out. Tough it out. Things will get better from here. If you were to ask me if there's one thing from my childhood I would change, there's, there's nothing. I, I wish my father had stopped drinking. I wish my kid sister had had a, a, an easier life. But those aren't things I could change. You can't change somebody else's life. Um, there's nothing that happened to me that I regret. That being said, there is no amount of money you could pay me to relive all that. <laughs> but I think you, know, you, you go through these things and you emerge, you emerge okay if you choose to. And I, I do believe it's a choice. And I believe that mom and dad, for all their, their faults and their failings, and Lord knows they had a lot, but I believe that my, my father in the glass castle gave me the gift of dreaming. And my mother gave me the gift of optimism. And, and life gave me the gift of reality. And I, I, I believe I was given the tools to, to get through. I mean. I think that right now I am perhaps the luckiest person in the world. I just, I get to go to colleges and universities and talk to students who are reading my book. My gosh, what, I mean, and, and so people ask me why I'm not bitter and angry. How could I be bitter and angry? I am, I am so lucky. Why be bitter and angry about what happened? If you are where you want to be, why be bitter and angry about how you got there? So, so there's, there's nothing that it, I needed to know, it, sometimes you need to, to, to sort of learn these things and go through these tough periods. I mean, I'm not trying to whitewash my past. I would have given anything to have been a popular kid, you know? Um, but I think that as, as a writer, sometimes you get great material that way. Um, Mar uh, Proust one time said he, he had the worst childhood of any human being on this planet, and that may be true. And, and look at the great gifts he got from that, the insights into human nature. So you might not, at the time, you might hate it, and oh, God, you know, I, I wish I were anybody else on the planet. But then you get through the other side, and it's like, yeah, it, it serves a purpose if you let it. Mm -hmm. Any of us who have survived childhood have enough material to yeah. um, write for a lifetime. Yeah, I think it's a great curse to peak in childhood. <laughs> you know, if you, if you have great teen years, where do you go from there? I mean, <laughs> one of the great things about having an awful childhood is you don't want to go back to it. You know, you never, <laughs> you don't have a rest of adolescence where you're like, oh, those are the best years of my life. Oh, those are the worst years of my life. I'm so happy to be out of them. So, you, you, like you said, you get great material from it. You get insights into, into human nature. Um, you know, I was, um, I was at a book signing not long ago, and the... Um, the woman who was homecoming queen 
a couple of years ahead of me. She came up and asked me for my autograph. And I thought, the lo you know, the world is turned upside down. The homecoming queen is asking the class being checked for that. And she, she couldn't have been sweeter, could not have been nicer. And she started telling me about some of the things that had gone on in her family that I had no idea. So, you know, some, you might think you know the story of everybody going on. Because I, I remember her going around the school you know, the halls of my school, and she, she was a cheerleader with a little flouncy cheerleader skirt, and she was so beautiful. I remember looking, you know, God, she's so, uh, she's perfect, and her life is perfect. And after she told me some of her stories, well, it wasn't so perfect, was it? And I just think that that's important to remember, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I love going around and telling my story, is to remember, you know, we all have stories. And, um, just, just don't assume, first of all, don't assume that you're the only person going through these things. Shame is a very isolating emotion, and you think, oh, nobody would understand, this is so weird. And once you tell your story, you realize, you know, my story might be a little bit different from my neighbors, but we can still connect on some level. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I so love the, that, that, that students are reading my story, is that it, it, I think it opens up dialogue about poverty and homelessness, but I think that a lot of kids are also able to talk about issues such as alcoholism and bullying that affect them personally, that they might be a little bit too intimidated to discuss, uh, that they might feel sort of invading their privacy if they discuss it in relation to themselves. And then maybe if they discuss it a, a little bit and can feel comfortable, they can say, well, I, I know this because I experienced it. And, and then that can take you out of that, that isolation of shame. Yeah, one of my my students have been reading The Glass Castle, oh, oh. and they're very excited that you're here. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's really wonderful. One of the things that they said they learned was that pe about people's stories, and when they look at you and hear about your um, adult life, they think the same thing, that, oh, she had this story behind her, um, and you should just not assume things about people. So I think that that message is really conveyed through your memoir. I wonder how you found the voice to share your story. How did you find that writing voice, that yeah. person to speak out um, and move past the shame? Well, that took a while. That took a while, to be honest with you. Um, I, as I'd mentioned, I, I tried a couple of times to write my story when I was younger, in my teens and my 20s, and in my 30s, and every time I'd write a couple hundred pages and just throw them away. Um, it was really my husband, um, my second husband, who's also a writer, and he was the one who really urged me to tell my story. In fact, the very first time I, I told him anything about my, my childhood, he, his very first reaction was, you need to, to write this. He later confessed to me he thought I was making some of it up because it was so wacky. I thought, I had a little loopy there. And then he met my mom and he said, okay, <laughs> okay, she's complicated. Now I get it. Now I get it. And you really must write this story. Um, so I, I, I sat down and I wrote the first version in six weeks. And, um, and it was very, very bad. My, my bad writing default mode is a, is a sort of very stilted form of journalism. And... Um, I, I came to realize the degree to which I use writing to distance myself from emotions. My, my agent said she, she read it and she felt it as though it had happened to somebody else. Um, and so I spent five years rewriting it, trying to be honest. I, I, I found that whenever I wrote it as an adult looking back, I would lapse into this sort of, my mother was obviously suffering from feelings of insecurity, blah, blah, blah. And I made the decision to write it as a child going through these things, and that, that was the way I felt that I could be most honest about what was really happening. I also made the decision not to pass judgment or to try to analyze the situation while it was happening for a couple of reasons. The first is a child usually doesn't. I don't remember thinking about my parents, well, they're doing this for them, because you accept that world, your, the, your world as reality. But moreover, I wanted to let Maybe it's my journalism background, but I wanted to let the readers draw their own conclusions about what, about what they thought of the story. Um, some people, it's been fascinating to me because some people who read my story think that I had an abusive and a neglectful childhood. Um, other people think that my, some people think that my parents should have been arrested and I should have been taken away from them. Other people say, well, certainly there were, there were 
flaws in their parenting skills, but they also had great gifts and they passed those those gifts along to their children. And um, book clubs tell me, they say, oh, we had the most heated debate ever about your book. You know, I hate your parents, my best friend loves them, which of us is right? And that's the way it should be. People should, we, we it, it, two people can look at the same president, and one person will see a hero and the other person will see a villain. That's the way life is. They're looking at the same facts and coming up with entirely different conclusions. So if people can be looking at my story and see an entirely different thing and have a heated debate about it, that's fabulous. And if people can discuss issues of parenting and childhood and poverty and abuse and, and what do parents owe children and what do children owe parents, um, and if, if children can be discussing this and book groups can be discussing this. One of the things that makes me happiest is very often uh, a parent will come with a child and say, we've discussed this book together and had a really interesting and tough conversation. That so exceeds any hope that I ever had for my raggedy little story that people can discuss these issues. But finding that voice, that, that, was, that was perhaps the biggest challenge of, of writing my story. And I, and, and I think that goes to my mother's, when she said, just tell the truth. It sounds like a very simple challenge, but it's a very, it's a, it's, it's, it was a tough thing to do because in telling the truth, I mean, what is the truth? And um, even though it's, it's, even though it's nonfiction, there are so many ways to tell the truth. I could have made my parents seem a lot better by not including some of those details. I could have made them seem a lot worse by not including some of the better details and including a lot more of the bad stories. You have to make the decision. And tell, you know, I was, I was 40 years old when I, I finally sat down to tell the story. So you have 40 years of anecdotes, which do you include? So you shape your, your truths by which stories you, you tell and how you choose to tell them. And how, how do I depict these incredibly complicated people? My father, who had so much good in him, but had so much darkness as well. How do I convey this man who, who, who I loved so much, but I knew was so damaged? And my mother was an even greater challenge because you know, she, she's not an evil person, at least I believe she's not. Some, some readers think she is, but she's, she's certainly not gonna be awarded mom of the year. But I, I, there were so many stories that I could have included that I didn't, but there were a couple that I, there's a story that I told where, where we kids were all hungry and, and mom had some chocolate hidden. And I really wrestled with whether or not to include that because I could have easily left it out and nobody would have said, hey, there's a plot hole here. So you, I made the decision ultimately to include that even though I knew it would be, it would be devastating to the portrait of her because she did that, that sort of thing a number of times where she would hide food while we kids were hungry. And I thought it was very revealing not only about her but about my feelings. Uh, it went a long way towards explaining some of my feelings towards her. Um, and it's funny because when mom did ultimately read the book, she, she had no problem with that. She, she took issue with my perspective on a few things. She said, but I understand why you saw it that way. And you had to tell the truth as you saw it. And I thought, that's pretty darn fabulous. For everything I said about mom, she still understands that basic sort of principle of art, if it doesn't sound like I'm being too self-aggrandizing, that, it, that it, so much of it is a matter of perspective. And it, it's not necessarily the way mom would have told the story. Uh, but she doesn't dispute a single thing I wrote. She just sort of has a slightly different take on things. Um, and, and, and in finding my voice, in finding my reality of, of, of what was happening, I had to be honest. And I think that's why it took me five years, is because how did I really feel about these things? And so often I use humor to distance myself. You know, humor and pain, they live right next door to each other. And sometimes, sometimes one uses one inappropriately and you cross over. But there, there were things that I'd sort of laughed about my whole life that when I wrote them down, I was like, that, that's not that funny. Um, and there are some things I think that are genuinely funny. So, so how do you tell these stories accurately and truthfully? And, and, and I found that while I was writing, and I, and I tell aspiring memoirists not, not to read anybody else's work while you're, don't, you might look at memoirs while you're thinking about telling your story, but not while you're writing your story, because their voice will start invading yours. I've started reading Angela's Ashes at one point while I was working on, on The Glass Castle, and I found that Blarney started creeping into, you know, my wee little brother. You know, I never, I never got that bad, but I did find that the cadence started changing. And so you just have to be really, really honest about, well, well how did I feel? What, what, 
what was really going on and how did I feel about it? And it was, it was not an easy process. In fact, it was excruciating. In fact, there, was a, there were a lot of tears. In fact, the first time I read my story back, I was a little shocked. Mm -hmm. I, was a little, I was a little stunned. I think we all know things that we don't realize we know. But dang, some things happened to me. You know, and it's not the book I set out to write. Um, and the whole process of writing is the process of thinking and if you're lucky, the process of being honest. Because you, you look at your words and say, is that true? Am I being honest uh, about what really happened and how I felt about it? And luckily, my husband, since he's a writer, he called me on a couple of things. He said, uh, on, he read an early version, and he said, you know, Jeanette, if your parents weren't buying food, how did you eat? I said, I got by. He said, well, what do you mean you got by? I said, I may do. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, I just may do. He said, no, I don't know. You have to spell it all out. Oh, no way I'm going to tell about digging in the garden. Uh -uh. He said, you have to, Jeanette. If you're, going to, if you're going to tell the story, you can't be leaving things out. And I had never in my life told anybody about rooting around in garbage for food. It was, it was one of my most shameful secrets. And the first time I wrote that scene, um, I, my face was just burning with shame. And I had to write that scene about 19 different times. Um, and it's so funny, that scene, I mean, I dug food out of the garbage a number of times, but for whatever reason, it was most shameful when I was in high school. Um, and it's funny, now that I've written it, it doesn't bother me. Uh, a very wise man once said to me, he said, secrets are a little bit like vampires. They suck the life out of you, but they can exist only in the darkness. Once they're exposed to the light, there's a moment of horror, but then poof, they lose their power over you. And I've just found that to be very true. Now it's just something that happened to me. And, but by writing it and confronting it and looking at what really happened, you understand it a lot better. And by reading my whole story back, I came to understand my situation better. I, I hope this doesn't all sound a little too self-referential, but people have asked me, how could you forgive your parents? I think the person I had to forgive was myself. And in reading my story back, it's like, dang, no wonder I did some of the things that I did. And um, it's funny, when, when the book came out, my brother and I went back to uh, West Virginia, the town I grew up in, West Virginia. Uh, Primetime Live was doing a segment on the book, and they wanted me to show them the garbage can at the high school where I dug out the food, and they wanted me to reenact the scenes for the camera. My brother said, you want to see the garbage can where I dug out food? And you could have knocked me over with a feather, because I had no idea my brother was doing the same thing. But of course he was. How, he, he, he was in the same boat that I was, but this is not something we talked about. You don't come home from school and, hey, I dug myself out this really good cheese pimento sandwich that somebody threw away. You know, so, um, but this is why I've become such a big fan of storytelling, is you realize you're not alone in this world. There are other people who've gone through similar situations, and they might even be your brother. And, and once you talk about it, you realize, I didn't think the less of Brian. I thought the less of myself for having done it, but I sort of admired him. And I think that sometimes we're so hard on ourselves for what we've gone through and what we've done. And, and once you tell your story, the number of people who've come up to me and told me their stories after an event, and usually they wait till the crowds are gone, and they'll sort of sneak up and they'll say, I've never told anybody this before. And then they'll tell me a story about their childhood. And very often they'll start crying. And they'll say, I'm so ashamed of this. And they tell me this an amazing story about survival and, and, and triumph. And I say, that's a great story. <laughs> Why on earth would you be ashamed of that? And then I remember, oh yeah, I was ashamed too. And, and, and so that's one of my, my missions in life, is, is to get people to, to confront their stories, to, to not carry them around as a source of shame, but rather as a source of, of pride. You don't have to tell somebody within the first two meet, minutes of meeting them, I dug food out of garbage when I was going. They, they don't need to know that, but you need to come to terms with it. Thank you so much for sharing your truth you. and being so honest in your writing and for helping to liberate so many people to share their story, even if they're only sharing it with you. Well, thank um, you. We'd like to thank Jeanette Walls for her time and for being so open and honest with us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.